Seeds of Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and today we start part six. Yes, part six of the Cattle Drives of Texas from 1866 to 1890. And in this episode, we're going to look at the particular effect of railroad development in Texas. Yes, it is a pretty thorough project when I worked on it, and there are a lot of things I would change, but I'm pretty proud of the way I looked at all these different aspects, and I hope you all have enjoyed it. There are a lot of room for improvement, and we'll get to that someday. But this is a good refresher for me, and especially this part, because what do you know about railroad development in Texas? Well, let's get into it, shall we? Texas railroad construction lagged behind during the 1850s. Before the first 20 miles of Texas track were laid in 1852, there was already 12,908 miles of railroad line in the United States. The Texas state government offered to aid railroad construction in 1852. And as I said, the first railroad in Texas was started in that year. It was the Buffalo Bayou Brazos and Colorado Railway running 32 miles from Harrisburg on Buffalo Bayou to Richardson on the Brazos. Houston built a line to join this one with money from a civic tax. Other lines then shot out from Houston to nearby plantation areas. One track eventually stretched from Indianola to Victoria, and another ran from Marshall to Shreveport, Louisiana. In 1854, the Texas legislature passed a general land law providing land grants of 16 sections for each mile of track. Relatively few railroad companies were attracted by this act, however, and by 1860, Texas had only 407 miles of track. The track stretched from Houston to a terminus on the Brazos, Colorado, and Trinity Rivers. The Buffalo Bayou, Brazos, and Colorado reached Brazoria County by 1861. But San Antonio, that important city in Texas, was not reached by a railway until 1877. And of course, the Civil War put a big hindrance on development of any kind, especially on railroads. So in a way, Texas was still almost landlocked in 1870, which is a funny way to say it, despite the coast. But it had, it had coastal ports, 583 miles of interstate railway, and a water route leaving the state at Jefferson in East Texas. Farmers and merchants relied on wagons and stagecoaches for shipment of their goods to ports or out-of-state markets. Many Texans believed that the state's economic development depended on the construction of a railroad network. Waiting on the slow passage of time to get something delivered from Jefferson or Houston or any other port or across land, overland from Louisiana or Arkansas took a lot of time. The Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad reached Denison, Texas in 1873. And in 1873, the Houston and Texas Central linked North Texas with the Gulf Coast. This was a big deal. By 1875, farmers could ship product through St. Louis to the East Coast after the Texas and Pacific reached the state. The Southern Pacific reached El Paso in 1881. As just mentioned, the first railroad to reach Texas from outside the state was the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas, better known as the Katy. The company had been chartered by Kansas in 1865 as a Union Pacific Railway Company Southern Branch. 
1870, the name was changed to Missouri, Kansas, and Texas, the same year that it was recognized as a Texas corporation by legislation. The Katy completed building the line through Indian Territory in 1872. The five miles from Red River to Denison, Texas, was completed the next year, connecting it with the Houston and Texas Central. Though the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas provided a method of shipping the Texas cattle, the long drives north continued. The railroads in Texas kept freight charges too high. It remained more economical to have herds trailed from Texas than carried by rail. The Missouri, Kansas, and Texas charged $5 per head from Dallas to St. Louis. The Texas and Pacific charged $5.50. If cattle were driven to Kansas, they could be shipped on the Santa Fe Railroad from Ellsworth to St. Louis for three fifty per head. The distance by rail was almost the same. When dealing with thousands of head of cattle, the difference of a couple of thousand dollars made a great difference. After adding the cost of trailing the cattle northwards to the cost of freight, it was still more economical than shipping out of Texas. As noted before, a trailing contractor would charge a dollar to dollar fifty per head and supply a fully outfitted drive making all necessary arrangements to ship the average herd of 2,500 cattle to St. Louis on the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad would cost $12,500. To have a trailing contractor make the necessary arrangements for the drive, including finding a northern buyer, would cost less than $4,000 at the most. The advantage is obvious. Now let's take a little short break. Thank Age of Radio for hosting Texas History Lessons, and then we'll continue on. An 1873 amendment to the Texas Constitution again authorized railroad land grants. After circumstances that we learned from the last lesson with the end of the Indian Wars on the Southern Plains in Texas, the Cattle Kingdom expanded westward after 1876, filling the panhandle and going past the Pecos. For many years, the cattlemen avoided the railroads because the freight charges were still higher than trailing to Kansas. Expanding railroad construction westward into the sparsely populated western Texas frontier was almost economically inviolable for the railroad companies. The answer to this problem came in the form of subsidies and land grants. Under the land grant law of 1876, 40 railroads built 2,928 miles of track and received $32,153,878 acres of land. Just over 32 million acres of land they received. The Texas and Pacific received the most land, over 5 million acres. The Texas legislature repealed the Land Grant Act in 1882. Railroads were still important, though. The railroad served as a focus for community and commerce as it spread out across Texas. Communities desiring railroads would subsidize them by giving land for depots and holding pens, right-of-ways, tax exemptions, and cash bonuses. In turn, the railroads took businesses away from surrounding communities. Towns grew from the railroad expansion, often established by promoters seeking to finance construction and induce freight and passenger traffic. Abilene, Sweetwater, Big Spring, Midland, and Odessa originated with such ventures between the railroad lines and the local citizens who desired service. To the north, similar agreements occurred. Cotton, gins, and other agricultural industries followed the railroads. Many cities began as railroad terminuses as the line was being constructed. An excellent example of this phenomena occurred with the birth of the city of Bowie in Montague County, Texas, where cattle from across the state of Texas were funneled on the Chisholm Trail. In 1858 or 1859, the first permanent settlement in the area began in the area of Queens Peak, near present-day Bowie in the southwestern quarter of Montague County. John Rowe and Mr. Cryer were the first settlers. Others followed. Cattlemen were attracted to Montague's southern grasslands about this time. The threat of Native American attacks kept them from spreading out too far, however, and they stayed close together for protection. In May 1873, 
the Texas legislature approved an act chartering the Fort Worth and Denver City Railway Company. The route was to run from Fort Worth to the New Mexico line. However, the Panic of 1873 caused a delay of nine years. The surveying for the route was completed by 1881. The roadbed was graded and cross ties were laid from Hodge, 14 miles from Fort Worth, to Wichita Falls. By February 27, 1882, the initial stretch for the railroad was ready for rails. The tracks reached Decatur by May 1st. The Fort Worth-Denver City Railway passed four miles from Queens Peak near the base of Cougar Mound, and that caused the birth of a new city, Bowie, named after the Alamo legend Jim Bowie. A tent city first sprang up near the tracks, and the tents were lined up parallel with the railroad, and the roads eventually became streets, being named for Montague and neighboring counties. Later, streets would be named after merchants. The first train, the Overton, arrived on July 1, 1882. That summer, the citizens of Queens Peak began to migrate to Bowie. Colonel Alsabrook and other merchants moved their stores from Queens Peak to the tent city, attracted by the rapid growth and the railroad. Alsabrook also arranged for the mail coaches to come to the town. The people from Queens Peak wanted to name the town Queenstown, or Queen City, but the post office rejected both names. The town was incorporated in 1883 as Bowie, and first mayor was D.C. Allen. The population was 1,100, had nearly 50 business houses and a newspaper. It had five saloons, three livery stables, 10 dry goods stores, two hardware stores, three blacksmiths, two restaurants, and one watchmaker, all because of the railroad showing up. And that year, Bowie shipped out 8,000 bales of cotton, 40,000 pounds of wool, 50,000 bushels of wheat, and numerous hides and pelts for a a total of $800,000 in exports. Then, coal was discovered north of the town near Brushy Mound. A St. Louis syndicate leased some land, dug a shaft, and began to build a tower and elevator. A small mining town grew up there called Tiger Town had two stores, saloons, a hotel, and livery. The coal turned out to be a poor quality, and the town was eventually abandoned. In 1892, the Chicago, Rock Island, and Gulf Railway also reached Bowie, and by the 1890s, it was the largest town in Montague, and still is to this day. In the early 1870s, Dallas became an urban center upon the arrival of railroads. Farmers and ranchers began bringing wheat, wool, cotton, and hides for shipment to market. Businessmen took advantage of this, converging on Dallas. Before the Civil War, Fort Worth was a minor trading center and a good place to stop on the way west. The cattle trade of the 1860s and 1870s energized Fort Worth. By 1870, 300,000 head of cattle had passed Fort Worth on the way to Kansas. Railroads reached Fort Worth in 1876. In the 1880s, the railroad lines expanded south to Corpus Christi, Laredo, and Brownsville. In 1870, Galveston, with a population of 14,000, was the largest town in Texas. Being a major port didn't hurt, and during the 1880s, railroads connected to Galveston carried cotton, hides, wheat, and other produce for shipment to the east and foreign ports. The Missouri, Kansas, and Texas, known as the Katy, came under the control of Jay Gould in 1880, and he initiated wide expansion of the Katy, but later left it in ruin. The Gainesville, Henrietta, and Western Railway built a railroad dump in 1885. Between 1886 and 1887, the company worked on constructing the railway from Gainesville to Henrietta, which is west. The first railroad train reached what became the town of Nocona on June 7th, 1887. And on July 23rd, 1887, the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas purchased the Gainesville, Henrietta, and Western Railway. The Katy was deeded to the MK&T of Texas in 1891, and Nocona, Texas, became a shipping point for cattle and other industries. After the railroad came, the people of other communities, Red River Station, Spanish Fort, Eagle Point, Redbud, Illinois Bend, and Duxbury. These are all little communities in the county. They began moving towards Nocona. Just a side note, the rails of the MK&T 
were removed in 1970, but you can still see where they ran through that part of the county. Between 1870 and 1900, railroads spread across the state of Texas. Commercial agriculture followed the railways. Cotton began to replace grain and cattle as a dominant economic factor. Railheads hooked Texas raw materials regional, national, and international producers. In 1872, Texas ranked 28th in railroad mileage across states. By 1880, it was 12th with 3,200 miles of track. By 1890, it was 3rd with 8,710 miles of track. And by 1904, it was first among states with over 10,000 miles of track. As the railroad grew, so did the population. In 1882, Collis P. Huntington of the Southern Pacific and Jay Gould of the Texas and Pacific organized a pool of fixed rates. With their lines and the agreements made in 1882 with other lines, Gould and Huntington control over half of Texas railroad mileage. In 1885, a number of trunk lines and main railroad routes formed the Texas Traffic Association to control Texas railroad rates. The Texas Attorney General, Jim Hogg, had the association dissolved by court decree in 1888. There was an outcry against the railroads claiming that rates were far too high and for years one form of monopoly or another would try to fix rates. Agriculturalists supported James S. Hogg's attacks on the railroad companies and he convinced the railroads to keep their headquarters in Texas and practice good maintenance of the tracks. He ran for governor in 1890 promising a state railroad regulatory agency. After he won the election... The legislator created a commission in 1891 to regulate the rates and fares of railroads. And this, as we'll see in the next part, all contributed to the decline of the long drive. I want to thank everybody again for listening to Texas History Lessons. That was a lot of information in that one. But as you can see, it's all pertinent as you see the importance that railroads had. And you'll see once the rates got fixed, it became economical to just ship the cattle on the Texas railroads, especially as more and more lines were added. I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank my Patreon supporters for providing support for research and writing Thanks again for everybody supporting Texas History Lessons Spotlight artist Mondo Salas and his group Rosemond. Be sure to check out his music and we'll finish the show with another great song by him. Thanks again. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Adios. Adios.